This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. We have a walk-in freezer that's not working properly. The complaint is that the box temp is high. I walked into the evaporator section, the fans are not running, doesn't make any sound at all. I come up onto the roof, nothing's running, no sound at all. So we're gonna open this unit up, start checking voltages and figure out what's going on. Okay, I wanted to stop for a second here and just give a brief re or rundown of how this walk-in freezer works for those of you that don't understand, okay? So this is a walk-in freezer and it's here to maintain their, their product at below freezing, okay? Typically on most walk-in freezers in restaurants, we wanna maintain about negative 10 degrees box temp because negative 10 degrees is kind of the perfect temperature to store ice cream at. So um, the sequence of operation is the condensing unit on the roof has electrical control over the evaporator section downstairs. This is an electric defrost system, okay? So each, each system can be different, but electric defrost. The defrost clock, which happens to be located on the roof, is essentially the brain of the walk-in freezer, okay? The defrost clock sends power down via the number four terminal to make the evaporator fan motors run, and then it also gives power to the thermostat, which decides whether it's warm enough in the box to send power to the liquid line solenoid valve, which opens and uh, opens the flow of refrigerant back up to the condensing unit. The low pressure control senses that pressure that the liquid line solenoid valve is opened and it turns on the condensing unit. So the condensing unit can cycle via the temperature controller, but the defrost clock at any given point can turn everything off and turn the defrost heaters on to try to melt any frost that might build up. It's very natural for frost to build up on a walk-in freezer, okay? So now that you kind of have an understanding of how this walk-in freezer works, when I mentioned in the in the very intro right there, I said, you know, I walked into the box, there was no fan motors running, there's nothing running on the roof, that's peculiar. Um, and uh, the, the defrost clock did not have the heaters energized. So that's why I was saying something quite wasn't right. Okay, so we'll get into the video now and then I'll explain some more. So I've got the unit opened up, nothing super scary jumping out at me. So the first thing I'm gonna do, this thing has an auto, re I mean a manual reset pressure control right here. I'm gonna push this. Okay, pressure control was tripped. Condenser fan motors came on, so that means that it went off on high pressure for some strange odd reason. So I'm going to uh, put some gauges on this unit and check it out. So my pressures already are pretty high, just standing pressures. It tripped the high pressure control again by the time I went downstairs. So this is my standing pressures. I'm gonna go ahead and reset it again. Shoot, it won't even reset. Because it hasn't uh, dropped low enough cycle yet probably as I'm looking at this there's an oil leak somewhere right here too because there's oil everywhere and I, I put some soap bubbles on the threads and I'm not seeing anything yet I oh yeah there's bubbles coming out of this cap right here where the straighter's at Let's see if I can zoom in here there you guys. There you go. It's bubbling right on this right here. Tiny, tiny bubbles, but enough to be a nuisance leak. So we'll make sure we fix that today too. Interesting. So I got it to reset, but then it pumped down. So now we need to go downstairs and find out why it's pumped down. Something is going on here that caused this unit to stop working. So originally it was tripped to high pressure. Once I reset that and went downstairs, it came back up, it was tripped again. I reset it, it started up and then it pumped down. And also the low pressure control is sticky. It wasn't uh, shutting off, I had to whack it with a, a wrench to get it to shut off, it pulled into a vacuum. So we gotta go downstairs and figure out why we are pumping down. Come into the box and I find switches off. Now that isn't, that was because they were trying to self diagnose it but the high pressure control was the problem my unit is running now now that I turn that switch on and mind you like I said that switch was because they were in there flipping things trying to fix it this morning but the high pressure control was the problem because apparently this thing's been down since last night so we're running a clear sight glass it's gonna be hard to see with the camera 
My pressures are yeah, about where they should be. It's about 105, 106 degrees. 130 degree saturation temp. I'd expect to see about a 25 or 30 degree rise over ambient on the condensing temp. That's about accurate. Um, these pressure controls are known to go bad. This is the little encapsulated, and they're known. The, the pressure cutout should be 410 on that one, and I bet you anything it cuts out sooner. So what I'm gonna do is block off this condenser and simulate slowly and see if I can get this pressure control to trip. Just put a panel on it. We're gonna watch and see what it trips at. So we cut out about 380 PSI. Um, it would be expected that we might hit 380 PSI because if we hit about 110, 115, which is possible because we're out in the high desert of Southern California, we would trip the pressure control early. So the solution here is we're going to clean up that condenser and we're going to change that pressure control uh, to a different style because those are just very, very unreliable. Now that you kind of understand a little bit, like I explained in the beginning on how the sequence of operation works down at the evaporator, okay, and how the defrost clock kind of has control over that, let's talk about on the roof, okay? We have three-phase power on this unit coming in. Three-phase power goes and sits at the top of the compressor contactor, okay? Um, there's also a control circuit that comes off of that three phase power you usually take two legs So it's going to be a 208 single phase control circuit and The power is going to one leg of the power is going to run through uh, the pressure controls It's going to go through the high pressure control and the low pressure control and then it's going to go to the compressor contactor So when the liquid line solenoid valve downstairs opens up and sends power or sends refrigerant up to the roof Okay, or lets the refrigerant flow back up to the compressor the pressure controls are what interprets that pressure signal, okay, let's call it a signal, or a pressure reading, and says, hey, there's pressure here, it's time to turn the compressor on. That's what the low pressure control sees, okay? But the high pressure control is also there, usually wired in series, but not always, but in this case it is, it's wired in series with the low pressure control, and it says, hey, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong it's time to shut off, okay? In our situation, what we found was that the high pressure control was not working correctly. The proper cutout pressure on that particular peanut style uh, high pressure control was 410 PSI and we were in like the 380 range. And kind of like I mentioned in the video with the high ambient temperatures that we're having, on average, um, the condensing temp can be about 25 to 30 degrees over ambient. So if we have a 110 degree day, it's not unheard of to see a 140 degree liquid saturation temperature, okay? If we have a 120 degree day, which is, you know, it's rare, but it does happen, okay? We hit 115, 117, 120, then your condensing temp can be anywhere from 25 to 30 degrees over that also, okay? So we can have extremely high pressures and, um, you know, that pressure control not cutting out at the right pressure causes an issue. It caused it to prematurely trip, essentially. Okay, back to the video now. Okay, to get started, what we're going to do, I've got the new pressure control. We're going to pump the system down to a very low pressure because we're going to change the low pressure control too. We're going to put in a dual pressure control. So we're going to front seat the receiver valve. And then we're going to watch the unit pump down. Once it gets low enough, I'm going to shut the system off because I don't want it to go into a vacuum. I just want it to be about 10 PSI, 5 to 10, because uh, we're going to have to disconnect this under pressure, this low side port. So. shut it off about right there and let it sit if it rises too much I'll turn it back on but 7 psi is pretty good when it gets this hot outside you gotta like throw a towel or something over your gauges or you'll ruin the screen on them so all right next thing we're gonna put in a dual pressure control I'll show you guys how I'm gonna do that and uh, because we we're gonna still have high pressure in here so we're gonna utilize this port right here that's actually leaking and put a permanent cap on it. And then uh, we'll put an access T on it actually. It's 
leaking anyway, so we needed to do something with it. So I'll put the access key on it and then uh, we'll be able to put the high pressure control on that. It's gonna go something like that. Should work perfect. It's so hot out here, my phone's overheating. It doesn't even seem that hot. It's only 112, but I don't know, whatever. Seems like it's been a lot hotter than that before, but okay. So, because um, my phone was overheating, I wasn't able to get the whole process here because I tried to film some of it. Put a new dual pressure control, routed the capillary tubes. I did it while it was under pressure. Notice we still have six pounds of pressure on the low side. And that's because I just pulled that off and popped that on real quick under pressure. I used uh, an existing Schrader port on the high side and, and this has a Schrader depressor in there. So I screwed this on, put the Schrader in here then uh, screwed that on hot while it had pressure under it to put and tightened it up so that way I could do it live. Um, I tried to route the capillary tube so they wouldn't rub out on anything. Um, I have no choice. I tried unscrewing this and uh, it, it seems like the Schrader's not there or the Schrader's busted on the other side of it because these normally come with a Schrader under them but I keep unscrewing it. I got it to just about the last thread and the Schrader never uh, closed so it was just spraying refrigerant. So I'm just gonna leave that on for now. Hopefully it doesn't leak. Um, our leak that I had found earlier was on that cap right here, remember? So, so that's it. We're ready to turn this guy on and hope that I wired it right. Pressure's kicking in. Let's see where we cut in at. We're kind of holding out. Oh, duh, silly. It's still uh, pumped down. <laughs> I'm a tard. All right. This is good though because I can actually crack it and see where it actually turns on at. So I'm going to give you guys that view so you can see what it actually turns on at. On at 26 PSI. Let's see where it turns off at. at 5 psi so that's good and then uh, this is an auto reset I know I'm gonna get all the people saying you should always have a manual reset well it gets so damn hot here if we have a manual reset I'll be out here every day so we set it for auto reset about 450 psi and uh, yeah we're gonna get this guy going all right we are pretty much gonna wrap it up I'm gonna go downstairs make sure we've got some noticeable drop in temperature I'm not gonna watch this thing come down to temp I'm confident that we fixed the problem so um, I cleaned the condenser, so I still have a wet coil right now, so. But head pressure dropped significantly. Sight glass is still clear, so that means the charge is good because if we've got a wet coil and a clear sight glass, and this unit has a headmaster, that means that the winter charge is, is good. So we know we're good on charge. Um, so I'm gonna button it up, watch it come down a little bit more, get my tools off the roof, and then go check on the box temp. All right, we are running. It's gonna be a long time. It's currently about 20 degrees in the box. Um, their ice cream is all hammered, liquid ice cream, but everything else is still somewhat frozen, so it'll take some time. Okay, hopefully you guys got that and I didn't confuse the heck out of you, okay? I tried to throw in some, uh, some audio, you know, where I thought maybe I should have explained things a little bit better, but overall, we had a walk-in freezer service call. When I arrived, I kind of jumped ahead of, you know, the the normal troubleshooting steps because I knew some things, you know, and I went right to that pressure control. OK, so you didn't see me get my meter out and start troubleshooting just because I was so familiar with the sequence of operation. The first thing I did was pushed on the pressure control. When the system came on, I knew something was funky there. OK, and that's when I found that the pressure control wasn't cutting out at the correct pressure. OK. Um, and with our ambient temperatures, it would be expected that we would exceed that 380 PSI potentially. Okay. So that's why I went ahead and changed that pressure control. Now, 
very controversial. You know, I, some people won't agree with it, but I put in auto reset pressure controls. Okay. Because I really don't have time to go back. I just make sure I don't set them above 450 PSI, but I will say you need to be careful because especially when you get into the scroll compressors, they don't like those high pressures and they tend to have issues. So, um, but I still, even on the scroll compressors install, um, auto reset pressure controls. I just make sure that I have them set correctly. The peanut style control that I pulled off of this system, they're junk. Okay. I don't like to talk crap about people's products, but they do not last in the very beginning. They'll work and they'll function correctly. But after a few years, they're not accurate and they're not adjustable. That's the problem. Um, they're convenient in the fact that they fit into tight places. And I understand why the manufacturer used them because it's easier. It's cheaper. They can throw one of those on and call it a day. I've used them before. I still install those on like air conditioners and stuff where I don't want to install a pressure control. So, I mean, they're a necessary evil. You know, sometimes you just got to use them. But, you know, if at all possible, I try not to use those style pressure controls. OK, but went ahead and reset that, replaced the pressure control, put in a dual pressure control system. OK, um, I did have to rewire some stuff because this particular condensing unit did have a low ambient um, control circuit. Basically, that would ignore the pressure control and let the system run in case the system was bypassing or the headmaster was starting to bypass when it had a really low ambient temperature. That's a whole nother subject. Maybe I can go through that. That one's kind of confusing and how that works. But I don't need that low ambient system here. And I went ahead and pulled that out of the, um, the, the picture and just made it a basic system where the pressure controls control the compressor contactor and that's it. Um, other than that, guys, there really wasn't much more going on with it. Um, I did not watch the box come down fully in temperature. Most of the time on walk-in freezers, I don't, as long as I see a significant temperature drop and I don't find any other issues with it. You know, in my head, I kind of have an idea what the pressure should be. It's very important that when you're working on this kind of equipment, you know, you really shouldn't be putting your service gauges on there unless you understand what the pressure should be. On a typical walk-in freezer, I know, especially if it doesn't have a microchannel condenser, you're typically going to be 25 to 30 degrees over ambient on your condensing temp. And down at the evaporator, we're typically going to have a 10 degree evaporator TD. So that means whatever the box temp is, my suction or my uh, liquid, my my vapor saturation temperature or my evaporator temperature will typically be 10 degrees below the box temp um, for the most part. Now, evaporator, uh, the TD, you know, that's mainly when it's closer to being down to temp. OK, and your expansion valve will change that. So when your expansion valve opens and closes, that evaporator temperature will fluctuate. OK, so it's very important that you don't assume that your pressure should be this right on startup. You got to let it stabilize out. Um, it's important to make sure you have a clear sight glass on any refrigeration system that has an expansion valve. It's requiring a full column of liquid going to that expansion valve. Okay. So it's very important that we have a full col column of liquid going to the expansion valve. That's one of the first things I check. Then I look for that condensing temp over ambient, approximately 25 to 30 degrees above that. Look at my evaporator, uh, box temp. I should say, look at my box temp. And then once I get close to being down to temp, Look at my uh, evaporator TD, which should be about 10 degrees below box temp. Uh, that that's the liquid or the vapor saturation temperature or the evaporator temp. Okay, um, so that kind of gives you an idea where your pressure should be. I don't really pay so much attention to pressures per se as much as I do the um, the saturation temperatures. That's the really important thing to understand. If any of you guys are making the switch from air conditioning to refrigeration, if you can understand that, that will get you a long way. You really should understand that in air conditioning too because it really simplifies a lot of things. You know, if someone says, hey, what should your pressures be on 410A? I don't know, but I know that my evaporator temperature is supposed to be, you know, whatever. I know, you know, on 404A, I know what my evaporator temperature should be, but do I know what the pressure should be? Eh, not so much, but I can remember the evaporator temperature. So if you can look at temperatures, it'll actually make your job easier and you can get used to it and start understanding, you know, on most air conditioners, you're going to have a 35 degree TD on the evaporator. So that means whatever the space temp is, your suction uh, saturation temperature or your evaporator temperature will approximately be 35 degrees below that. You know, and it could change a little bit with every manufacturer. But as long as you kind of have a general idea what your pressure should be, whether you're working on air conditioning or refrigeration, it's really going to help you. OK, or what your saturation temperature should be, I should say. Um, I'm rambling at this point, so I'm going to go ahead and close this up. I really appreciate you guys watching these videos. Any questions you guys have, please, please send them to me. HVACRvideos at gmail.com is my email address. I go live Monday nights, work permitting, at 5 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, and I usually answer as many questions as I can. I'm on there for about an hour and a half, so I try to get to everybody's questions. 
Send me um, comments on Facebook, on uh, Instagram, uh, on the YouTube stuff. I try to get to it all as much as possible, okay? And then I'll usually address it. If I get repeat repetitive questions like over and over from different people, I'll definitely address those on the live stream when I go live, okay? Uh, other than that, guys, we will catch you on the next one, okay?